So it's my pleasure to, to introduce our speaker, uh, Ted Slayman from the University of California in Berkeley. So we are very grateful that he um, was willing to give the first um, talk in our seminar session. In particular, given the fact that it's uh, 7 a.m. in the morning now on, on um, his side. So we are very grateful and he's going to talk about recursion theory and Diophantian approximation. So please, Ted, um, go ahead. You have the word now. Okay, thanks, Bosco. And um, I want to thank the organizers for setting up this, this seminar. It's quite a, a nice idea and uh, for inviting me to give a talk and the chance to talk about some recent work. Uh, in addition, I'd like to say something about this talk. Um, we lost a very gracious colleague this in the past few days, Jans Erik Fenstad, who was uh, a leading figure in the in the uh, sort of thrust to generalize recursion theory from hype theory to recursion theory in higher types and admissible structures. He was um, you know, I wrote what I wrote here: a scholar, teacher. He ran a really uh, strong group of, of people working in, in that area in Oslo for several years. He was an academic leader. He was uh, rose high in the administration of the University of Oslo, and he was uh, a prominent figure in the establishment of the Abel Prize. Uh, he wrote several books, including this one, which I studied when I was a graduate student, uh, General Recursion Theory. Uh, and finally, it's, I met him when I was when I was just starting out, and he was he was quite uh, encouraging to me and quite kind to a beginner, and I appreciated it quite a lot. So it's it's a loss that he's gone now. Okay, so what I want to talk about today is is uh, some work that I've been uh, working on over the past several years now. Uh, it's centered on features of approximating real numbers by rational numbers. And uh, I see it, see it as a uh, an application, an application of, of recursion theoretic thinking. You know, the, the properties that I'm going to talk about are normality, which uh, is a is a property. We think of it as a property of a real number, but it's really a property of the representation of that real number. And the second one is this exponent of irrationality, which also is is uh, less familiar to people, uh, at least it was to me, outside of uh, analytic number theory. But it also is a, is a quantitative measure of how well a number, a real number, can be approximated by rational numbers. So recursion theory has to do with definability and uh, in particular approximability, and that these the kinds of questions that one looks at here are questions of that type. So it's a natural synergy between uh, areas. All right, so what I'm going to talk about oops, there we go. Yeah, so what I want to talk about is not actually, you know, what I'm the things I've mentioned, it's not actually a subject that's internal to computability theory, which is where most of my my experience lies on aspects of Turing degrees or, or uh, hierarchies of definability, that sort of thing. But the perspectives that, that recursion theory brings and the sort of technical aspects of the subject, the techniques that we've evolved to answer the sort of questions that drive us are applicable to ideas, out, to areas outside of, outside of computability. And then we can mix those, that kind of perspective right, with ideas from probability, dynamical systems, harmonic analysis, number theory, combinatorics. And uh, I think we have equal footing with, with uh, you know, the practitioners from those other areas. And the, the contribution that we have is, is unique to our subject. And it's interesting to see how it mixes with those, with those other uh, streams. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about, uh, and my apologies to people who have heard parts of this talk before, uh, is, is uh, 
sort of laid out here. I'm going to start with, with how effective, how recursion theoretic ideas contribute to the study of randomness, in particular for the big measure. Then how, what I think is a pretty successful investigation into how computability theory gives insight into properties that have to do with how stork dimension. Less well developed is, is how those ideas play with uh, harmonic analysis and issues of, of properties of measure and properties of reals uh, having to do with uh, for the Fourier transform. And then finally, we'll apply the, apply the facts that we pull out of there into this, these issues of Diophantine approximation. But like Bosco said, if somebody has a question of clarity or uh, you spot something wrong with my slides, please feel free to bring it up. I'm happy to respond to questions. So the, the now classical theory of randomness for Lebesgue measure. So there's two aspects of randomness that are prominent in uh, algorithmic information theory. So the first is you could sort of say randomness is measured from a, from a uh, set, sets of reals perspective. So a real number is Martin Luff random. If it doesn't belong to any effectively presented null G delta. So that means that if you have a uniformly computably enumerable sequence of open sets, uniformly means you have one algorithm that works parameterized by n, and a computably enumerable for an open set is a set such that uh, we're in the space two to the omega, you can enumerate the basic open sets whose union is the open set. And a basic open set is determined by a finite binary sequence. Okay. Okay, so if you have a, a uniformly computably enumerable sequence of open sets, so that's a present such that the nth open set is measured less than one over two to the n, you've specified a null set. Right? The null set is the intersection of all those open sets, and a Martin Luff random real is one that doesn't belong to that intersection. So you've specified in this way for Martin Luff randomness a collection of, of sets of measure zero, and a, a random real is one that doesn't belong to any of those measure zero sets. Excuse me, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not an expert in computability. Can you define uniformly computable enumerable? Yeah, so that, that means that you have one, one uh, algorithm. The algorithm can enumerate uh, finite binary sequences and pairs j such that j, j is an integer greater than zero. So the, the finite binary sequence sigma belongs to oj if and only if the algorithm enumerates the pair j sigma. The open set is determined by the set of reals. The, the jth open set, O sub j, is the set of reals where I'm using the word real to refer to a infinite binary sequence. It's the set of reals x such that there exists a sigma such that j sigma was enumerated by the algorithm. Okay. Okay, so it's, it's, a no, it's a notion of, it's identifying a notion of randomness by identifying a, uh, a measure zero set and saying that a set is random or a collection of measure zero sets, saying that a, a real is random if it avoids that countable collection of measure zero sets. If you expand the, the collection of null sets that, that the uh, real is supposed to avoid, you get stronger and stronger notions of randomness. If you avoid fewer null sets, you get a weaker notion of randomness. Okay, so that's, that's one point of view on randomness. A random real is a real that exhibits the almost everywhere behavior of the continuum. The second aspect of randomness is, is formulated uh, more locally. It's a proper a sort of internal property of the real number itself, or at least conceptually. Right? So real number is algorithmically incompressible. If there is a constant C such that for all L, K of C restricted to L, which means the uh, sequence of the first L bits in the base two representation of C. So the Kolmogorov complexity of the first L bits of C is, is up to an additive constant uh, equal to L. 
Okay, so that says that that the the information that's inside the first L bits of C is incompressible. You need L, you need up to a constant uh, L bits, L facts to determine to, to compute uh, the first L bits in the expansion of the real C. Okay, so it's also it's, it's also a kind of uh, if you think of a random sequence as a sequence such that each of its digits is chosen at random independently from all the others, then this, then uh, to know what that sequence is, you have to know what those independent va values are. Okay. Is this you notion, can also, so, I'm sorry, is this notion independent of the base? It's, yeah, so it's, it's uh, yes, it's independent of the base because base transformation is, is a computable operation. Okay, so it's, it's, um, it's also that nothing that's really tied specifically to, to computability. You could look at compressibility in, in terms of all sorts of varieties of descriptions, right? A computable description is, uh, you know, so how, a description of a finite sequence. Right? So you could talk about arithmetic incompressibility or um, up and down the scale. In increase the, the power of what you can use to describe finite sequences and you can make it more and more difficult to be descriptively incompressible. So there's a, there's a hierarchy of randomness calibrated by these uh, criteria of specific specification. Okay, so for for the in the algorithmic case, there's a this nice theorem of Schnorr, which says that C is Martin Luff random if and only if it's algorithmically incompressible. So the two aspects, the two ways of viewing uh, or characteristics of, of random reals, when you when you calibrate them or, or measure them computationally, right, you get the same notion of randomness. You identify the same sequences as being random. And so this is this is uh, cited as a as a robustness notion for for uh, computationally random that that viewed even from two what seem like conceptually different points of view, you identify the same sequences as being random. So maybe there's a there's a very robust notion of randomness sitting there. It's also it's also a uh, a theorem that says that that if you if you calibrate the, how you're measuring randomness algorithmically, then you can't distinguish between these two conceptual aspects of randomness. We didn't we didn't see that that there's a difference between compressibility and a kind of almost everywhere view of what it means for a point to be to be random. So I'm going to come back to that later. Okay, so this this. Uh, Theorem right, is a general, a general. Uh, well, it's an example of a more general way of thinking about randomness, which has recently really been brought to the foreground by work of Jack Watson and his collaborators. There's an intuitive duality between points, between looking at a random real and looking at uh, a set of reals of positive measure. So if a property is true of a, of a random point, then uh, you would think that the set of reals that satisfy that property has positive measure. And similarly, if you have a set of positive measure, then uh, according to these criteria we just met, mentioned, it has an, for any null set, that set of positive measure has a real that avoids the null set. So sets of positive measure have random, have random elements. Okay, so there's a you can and then you can use this kind of uh, point of view right, and, and quantify it, right? So for example, a pi zero one class that's a a uh, well, it's a set of reals that satisfy a pi zero one uh, definition. So it has positive measure if and only if it has a Martin Luff random element, and much a much finer analysis was given by this theorem of Kuchera which says if a pi zero one class P has positive measure and R, an infinite binary sequence is Martin Luff random, then uh, there's a tail of R. So you throw away finitely many of the 
the initial bits of R, and you and the remaining sequence um, belongs to the pi zero one class. So any set of positive measure has a has mod finite, uh, a representative. You know, every every random real mod finite uh, belongs to a pi zero one to any pi zero one set of positive measure. So that's it's if you wanted to analyze pi zero one sets of positive measure, it's sufficient to analyze Martin of random reals. Okay, so in the, this point and set reasoning, uh, it should be, it's a tool, it's a conceptual tool. And, there, and one should hope that there's a graceful way, there's a way to hold both points of view in mind at the same time, so that you can move from one to the other in the context of, of a mathematical investigation. Uh, and whatever, whichever is more convenient to analyzing the problem that you're interested in is, is the point of view that, that you uh, adopt. Okay, so I want to shift now to, to the same point of view uh, with regard not, not to just Lebesgue measure, but to, to other, other interesting classes of measures. Right? And, and these different classes of measures show up in, in the adult in the analysis of various sort of mathematical phenomena. So Hausdorff dimension is a, is a, uh, it's a, it's a basic tool in geometric measure theory, uh, especially with regard to, in, to analyzing sort of fractal sets, uh, sets that are generated by net dynamical systems, things like that. Okay, so it's usually defined in a way that's similar to the definite to what we did with uh, Martin Lope randomness and the usual definition of Lebesgue measure, but there's an equivalent formulation uh, by Frostman's lemma. So I'm going to take that as a definition. So you have a set A, a subset of the of uh, the real numbers, and it's Borel. It has Hausdorff dimension at least s if there is a measure, uh, a Borel measure, such mu such that that measure doesn't concentrate uh, too much. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't compress the measure too much with re in comparison to Lebesgue measure. Namely, uh, if, you have a, if you have a real C and you look at the ball around C of radius R, that's this, then the measure of that ball, right? is less than or equal to a multiplicative constant times uh, the radius of the ball raised to s. So the dimension, the dimension of the set uh, is at least s if there's a Borel measure that mu that gives a positive measure and it doesn't compress, uh, mu doesn't compress its mass too much on any sort of interval centered on a point C, the measure of the interval is related to the radius of C by this exponent. Okay, and the Hausdorff dimension of A is the supremum of such S. Ed? Okay, yeah, go ahead. Uh, the balls, how are they related to A? Well, the, the balls are just the usual, the usual balls in... in okay, so um, it doesn't shrink the balls overall much. Yeah, that's Thank right. You. So if you look around any point and the mass doesn't concentrate too much around that point, right? The, Thank you. The, the measure doesn't con concentrate too much. I'll give an example in a second. So for in particular, this, this is a continuous measure. It doesn't, it has no atoms. It doesn't concentrate any mass on any point. So that's, you know, that's one, one aspect of it. When mu is, 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 uh, has this property that shows up in the definition. You say that it's S regular, or uh, there's something called the mass distribution property, which says that the mass doesn't concentrate too much in the sense of this, the, the measure doesn't concentrate the mass too much in the sense of satisfying this inequality. So mu has the mass distribution property for exponent S. Okay, so example, the Cantor middle third set, that's the set where you start with the unit interval and you, you by recursion, keep throwing out the middle, the middle three, throw away the interval from uh, one third to two thirds, and then in each of those remaining intervals, you throw away the middle third and so forth. That's a set of measure zero because 
you're sequentially uh, throwing away of the third of the measure at, at each step. So you, in the end, you throw away uh, all the measure. So it's, it's, a, it's a null set, right? However, the, so Lebesgue, Lebesgue measure get, says it's trivial. However, the, these, uh, it has Hausdorff dimension. The Hausdorff dimension is, is, is indicated log two over log three. And the measure that you get by saying sequentially, it's the uniform measure on the Cantor set. Sequentially, the measure from zero to a third and the measure from uh, two thirds to one uh, each of those intervals gets measure a half. We threw away the middle third and redistributed, redistributed its measure uniformly to the two parts that were left. And then sequentially follow that process down. The measure from <clears throat> zero to a ninth is a fourth, it's, and so forth. That's the uniform measure on the Cantor set. And it's a good example of a, of a measure that has the mass distribution property. Its, it's uniform measure is, has as this, uh, its value of S is uh, the same as the Hausdorff dimension, log two over log three. So you can see how you can get an interesting measure uh, on a null set. And it's tied to the dimension of uh, that null set. Okay, so now this, like, like happened with Lebesgue measure, there's a notion of, of uh, a point being random. Uh, in this in this more general sense, and that's this was introduced uh, by Lutz, and as I said, it's using uh, defined in terms of martingales by by Riemann in terms of open covers, and eventually, since we're talking about points, the the uh, a theorem of Meyer Domo gives us the the uh, which I'm going to take as the definition, the characteristic of a real called its effective Hausdorff dimension. So the effective Hausdorff dimension for a real uh, C is the infimum of the numbers R such that for infinitely many L, the sequence of the first L bits in the binary expansion of C has prefix free Kolmogorov complexity less than or equal to R times L. Okay, so for martin Luff random reals, the, the initial segments of, of a martin Luff random real cannot be compressed more than a fixed constant. Inter the information that's there, the Kolmogorov complexity of the initial segment, is L up to a fixed constant. For effective Hausdorff dimension, the complexity might of the initial segment might drop down um, a fraction. If it drops down, if the initial segment complexity is of the first L bits is L over two infinitely often, then the effective Hausdorff dimension is of the real is less than or equal to a half. Right? If it's L over, if you can compress it by down to a third, if the, if, if the complexity is a third of the length of the sequence, infinitely often then the effective Hausdorff dimension is uh, no more than a third and so forth. If you can compress arbitrarily, an arbitrarily multiplicative factor uh, if we often, then the effect of Hausdorff dimension is zero. Yeah. So for almost all reals, the effect of Hausdorff dimension is one. For random real, the effect of Hausdorff dimension is one. You can have reals that have effect of Hausdorff dimension one without there being Martin Luff random. Just like you can have sets of Hausdorff dimension one that are not, uh, that are null sets. Okay, so here, here are some basic uh, facts. The set of reals that have effective Hausdorff dimension D is a set of Hausdorff dimension D. So there's some, some indication of uh, what's true about the points. The internal properties of the points has to do, has a bearing on, on, uh, on the macroscopic properties of the sets to which those points belong. And then a nice theorem of, of Jack and Nick Lutz is that uh, if you have a set, an arbitrary set, the Hausdorff dimension of that set is the infimum over all uh, B, the infimum over all reals, which you can think of as a looking relative to B, uh, the supremum of all C that belong to the set of the effective Hausdorff dimension of C relative to B. So if you, if you, you look at all possible uh, 
it's and this is a, a reflection i guess of saying that that uh, you can view Hausdorff dimension you can evaluate Hausdorff dimension in terms of of regular measures and b would be a, would give you some indication of how to describe uh, what's happening on a regular measure okay but there is a and and jack and his collaborators have some really interesting uh, applications of this fact now, in terms of, of uh, this, this dichotomy between uh, measures and points, there's a nice theorem that Jan Ryman proved, which is suppose that, that you have a real that has effective dimension D. Okay. Then that, that real uh, looks random with respect to these uh, to S regular measures for any S that's less than D. So if C is, is, has effective dimension D, you can invert. You can invert the fact that internally C is, it, uh, is compressible only down to, to D, right? You can invert that fact about the real into the existence of a global object, namely a measure, right? It's on on the, the full uh, Cantor set, such that that measure is globally has the has the uh, mass distribution property, and C is a, is a typical point for that measure. Okay, so you can go from the the incompressibility, the algorithmic incompressibility of C, right, to the existence of a global object, which is a measure. Right, C looks random for that measure, and uh, the measure has the global incompressibility property uh, of being S regular. Okay, so that's a nice transfer theorem, right? That you can go, you can go, and and it's also the case. It's also the case that if you if you have a S regular measure and you look at a, a random real for that measure, it's going to have effective dimension D, which it, which you can sort sort of see from from the previous theorem of lots and lots. Okay. No, I wanted to talk. Yeah, go ahead. A stupid question, quickly. So, is this notion of Kolmogorov complexity is it the same as word complexity? Like you look at the number of different of uh, different words and translate over strings of like sen or something like that. Yeah, it's it's the Kolmogorov complexity. So, crudely speaking, the Kolmogorov complexity of a finite sequence sigma is the length of the shortest program uh, which outputs sigma. Yeah, but uh, this language is, uh, I'm sorry, I'm a complete outsider. This language is not familiar to me, but I understand the word complexity in the sense that I just said. So, for example, uh, different number of words of length n that uh, you can see or something like that. So, yeah, it's, well, it's, the, it's, it's a descriptive concept. So the complexity... So these are not related? Not that I know of. Okay. It's, it, maybe I don't really understand what what it is that that I don't I know what Kolmogorov complexity is. I probably don't understand fully what the concept that you're trying to relate to it. Okay. But but crudely think speaking, you could say that the complexity of a sequence is the length of its shortest description. Okay. okay so I want to turn to to something that's that's much uh, more closely tied to these uh, Diophantine things that I'm going to get to. Uh, next. So that has to do with, with um, harmonic analysis. So the, the, let me recall, uh, the Fourier transform of a, of a Brel measure mu uh, is given by this formula. So it's, it's a, uh, notice the free variable here that mu hat is a, is a function, right? The variable there is t. And then that t is showing up here in the exponent of this, of this uh, harmonic function. Okay, so it's, it, you could uh, think of t as telling you a frequency. And mu, mu hat of t is the Fourier transform of t is telling you how much, what's the frequency component of the measure. And if, if you have that, if mu is a measure that's given by a density function, so if d mu is something of the form f of x dx, then uh, 
the Fourier transform is the same as the of the measure is the same as the Fourier transform of the function f, and that's you know it, it's uh, if you may or more be more familiar with the fo the Fourier series, where you look at f as being a sum of of uh, harmonic functions, uh, the Fourier transform is related to that. So it's telling you uh, it's telling you a way to to represent the measure as a sum of uh, frequency components. Okay, the Fourier dimension of a set is the supremum. It's a, another one of these uh, supremum definitions. It's the supremum of, this, of the S less than or equal to one. So it's, there's a measure. It has support A, so U gives A positive measure. And there's a positive constant C such that uh, for every possible frequency, the u hat at that frequency is less than or equal to c, the multiplicative constant, one plus t to the minus s over two. So it's the Fourier dimension of a set is uh, telling you how quickly uh, the frequency uh, in the in the Fourier transform is the, the contribution at higher frequencies is going to zero. Okay, so if a set has Fourier dimension, there's a, it's a regularity property of that set. Similar to saying that the mass is not distributed, uh, it's not concentrated too much. Here it's saying that, that the, the mass of the measure right, is being sort of uniformly distributed. It doesn't, the measure doesn't have lots of, of sharp drop-offs because the higher frequency components of in analyzing, uh, in, in representing the measure, right, are less and less important as the frequency goes up. And the rate at which their importance drops is given by this, given by this, uh, well, I can't seem to get that to work, but, all right. Okay, it's given by this term. So it's it's um, it's not a standard notation, but we're going to say in this situation where we have a measure like that 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 mu is a Fourier Fourier measure for dimension s. Because I want to talk about these. Now the Fourier dimension of a set is related to its Hausdorff dimension. And the Fourier dimension. That's why. That's why people put in the, this S over two factor is to correlate the Fourier dimension with the Hausdorff dimension. The Fourier dimension of a set is less than or equal to its Hausdorff dimension. It's, it's, uh, it's harder to have positive Fourier dimension because uh, you can't do things in the Fourier case like can happen in the Hausdorff case, the Cantor middle set. Uh, which I talked about earlier, which has positive Hausdorff dimension, has Fourier dimension zero. Right? The fact that it's divided up in, so abruptly, you keep you keep going from positive positive uh, occurrences of the set down to these empty empty holes in the set means that uh, there's lots of high high uh, frequency components in the in the Fourier transform, right? which which uh, produces uh, Fourier dimension zero. Okay, a set is a, is a solemn set if its Fourier dimension is equal to its Hausdorff dimension. A nice example of a, a solemn set is this set that we looked at, the set of C such that C has a fact of Hausdorff dimension D. That set, not, not only is it uh, have the right, not only does, the Hausdorff dimension reflect the effective dimension of its elements, but those elements are so nicely distributed, right, that the Fourier dimension of that set is is uh, is full, full within its Hausdorff dimension. Now, it's the Fourier dimension is is it's harder to analyze things, uh, in, because the calculation of what's the Fourier transform of a given measure is, is uh, often difficult to determine right? or even to implement. So it's harder, it's harder to come up with examples of sets that whose Fourier dimension is equal to their Hausdorff dimension. It's harder to do that than it is to find sets of positive Hausdorff dimension. 
and the, the, all the nice examples that that, uh, that I know of come out of things that are like this descriptive this descriptive example that we have right here. Namely, they come from looking at properties of points and looking at the set of reals that have those points. So, so this kind of point to set then comes up to give the natural examples of so on sets. Okay, so the, the problem that, that, that I want to mention, or what, one of the problems I want to mention is, is the problem of reproducing, which I think is a, a successful investigation into uh, randomness for Lebesgue measure and then for effective you know, for Hausdorff dimension. Uh, what's the what's the uh, internal property of a random real for a measure of positive Fourier dimension? So it's you can ask you know, in, in let's investigate. Can we prove a theorem like uh, Schnorr's theorem? Or, th or theorems that like the Lutz and, and uh, Riemann theorems. Right? Can we figure out what is the local property of a real such that that real has, uh, is random for a, a set of positive Fourier dimension? In other words, there's a Fourier measure relative to which that real is Martin Luck random. Okay, so, there's a, so you can begin a logical investigation of uh, positive uh, Fourier dimension. So the first, the first fact here is is uh, joint with Marconi, Riemann, and Lanti, which is that the set of codes for closed Salem subsets of of the Cantor set is a pi zero three com complete set. So that's an index set calculation. So being a Salem set uh, is pi zero three complete if you look at at pi zero one classes. And the second, the second fact is that the set of reals C such that there is a Fourier measure making C random is sigma zero two complete. So it's a sigma zero two property. And it's not a, it's in the arithmetic hierarchy, it's not a complicated property. Uh, nevertheless, you know, the proofs here I, are, I find somewhat disappointing, right? They, they are uh, not looking internal to the properties of C. But they're looking at, at uh, basically f the way that Fourier measures uh, work. The fact that the Fourier transform is going to zero tells you that the set of possible ways to come up with a Fourier measure uh, is compact. And then you can leverage the compactness of uh, the space of representations of Fourier measures to get uh, these, these calculations, upper bounds and the complexities of these sets. Okay, so especially item two. It doesn't identify in the sense of, of uh, being incompressible with respect to Kolmogorov complexity or having, having uh, only compressibility down to a multiplicative factor, that those internal properties do not seem to refer to external representations of measures or, or global properties of the continuum. They, they look completely internal. And, and uh, we don't have we don't have a, uh, a criteria on a real or a, a sequence to be uh, random for some Fourier measure of particular dimension. Okay, so there's no, no identified candidate for effective Fourier dimension of a, of a singleton of the sort that we have in the previous two cases. I think that's a really interesting problem. Right? Now, and the interesting aspect of it is that these these sorts of Fourier measures and the way that uh, that things work relative to them have lots of applications. They show up; they are er everywhere, everywhere, and uniformly so in the study of uniform of distributions and, and uniform distributions. And so, let me give an example. Uh, so this is a theorem uh, with uh, Veronica Betcher and Jan Ryman which is a, is a uh, not very difficult generalization of a fact due to R. Baker, which is that if you have a Fourier measure mu and you, and you have a sequence of distinct integers, right, then you can look at, the, at uh, the sequence of reals 
which is given by uh, take take a generating point C and look at the sequence that you get by by uh, multiplying C pointwise by the elements of the sequence of integers. So you look at the you look at the sequence B I C that gives you a sequence of reals. That sequence of of reals uh, is uniformly distributed mod one. Okay, so if, if you have a Fourier measure and you have a sequence of distinct integers, then for, all, for a random real in the sense of that measure, right, the sequence that you get by multiplying that real uh, pointwise times these integers is uniformly distributed mod one. Okay, so for example, if the sequence, if it's just, if bi is uh, i, then you, you take, the, take the real and you keep shifting it by multiplying, you know, the ith element is just i times the sequence, throw away the integer part, that sequence is uniformly distributed. If you, it, um, okay, so there's, and that it's, it's, uh, oh, okay. I'll give an example now with Diophantine approximation in a minute. But you could ask, uh, is, is, is this uniform distribution? Is, is that a way to, to investigate properties of reals? Right, this property down here that says this sequence is uniformly distributed mod one is a property of the real. Right? It's not a property that refers to anything about, about measures or it's not formulated in terms of the existence of measures or uh, things of that sort. It's an internal property measured, uh, evaluated by looking at the real. It's not, not in the context of looking at the existence of certain measures. Right? So you could ask whether there's a family of functions, right, which is algor algorithmically presented such that, and here the functions are these linear functions, so, such that you know, for any, you know, look at the real and for any sequence of functions of this sort, look at the sequence of points you get by evaluating those functions uh, at that particular real, and the result is uniformly distributed. So, is there a is there a family of, is there a collection of families of functions such that if you're if a real uh, it generates sequences that are uniformly distributed under the application of those sequences of functions, then there's a measure. And things like that are, would be quite interesting. That's the typical sort of application of looking at a at a measure that's got Fourier dimension and sampling uh, the values of, of uh, various functions almost everywhere with respect to that measure. That's a typical application of, of uh, Fourier dimension. Okay, so now I wanna turn in the last, the last part of the talk to, to dial fancy and approximation, in particular uh, normality. So let's recall. C is simply normal to base B if in its base B expansion, each digit occurs with the expected uh, frequency asymptotically. So in binary, there's as many zeros as there are ones asymptotically. It's normal to base B if, it's, if every finite pattern, every block occurs with its expected value. So the block zero one occurs one fourth of the time if the se sequence is, is binary. It's absolutely normal if it's normal in every base. So it's a real number C, right? It has many different representations according to which base you use. And absolutely normal means it's normal to every base. Okay, it's normal to, so this has to do with the previous slide. C is normal to base B if and only if the sequence that you get by looking at uh, the iterative multiplication by B is uniformly distributed mod one. Okay, so C is normal to base B if and only if the sequence B to the N C for N in, in uh, omega is uniformly distributed mod one. So if C is, if C is uh, random with respect to some Fourier measure, then C is uh, absolutely normal by the previous fact. Okay. So that's, a particular, you know, I guess a, a generalization of this theorem of Borel. So Borel proved that almost all real numbers are absolutely normal. So a random real, a Martin Loaf random real is an absolutely normal real. That's how much randomness you need to, to run Borel's theorem. 
Actually, you need a lot less than that. Okay, so it's it's a typical thing that normality, simple normality, absolute normality, uh, are given as sort of characteristics. If you want to say what what happens for a random sequence, a typical thing to say is, well, you, you flip a coin, a fair coin, right? Asymptotic, it comes up, it's either heads or tails, right? But asymptotically, it's half heads and half tails. So flip the coin at random, and you're going to get as many heads as tails in the limit. So that's a standard, normality is a standard device to explain randomness. Uh, there's how, how, now we're gonna ask, like, how, how does normality play into and look like what we already saw was true about randomness? So there's a theorem of Schnorr and Stim that says the normality of a sequence is equivalent to its incompressibility by finite autonomy. So this doesn't have to do with reals, it, it has to do with sequences. Right. So the sequence is, is uh, random if you, if you can't, uh, if there isn't, it isn't a way to, by a finite optometer, uh, compress its elements uh, into, into a, by some invertible process. So you can go down and you can go back by finite automata. It's, it's, so that looks like Schnorr's theorem. Right. Now, uh, for Martin Luff randomness. But there's something that's different with regard to, to uh, normality and algorithmic in, information theory, which is that normality does depend on base, right? It's pre absolute normality says you're normal with respect to all bases, right? But, the, but normality, right, has to do with normality in binary or normality in base 10 or normality in base B. Right? They depend on uh, which base you're using, right? So there's many different ways to represent the same real, and those different ways to represent it have a, have a sort of common aspect. They all they all are uh, given by the same. It's a one parameter family of representations, where the parameters determining sort of how you're going to how you're going to find sub-intervals in your approximation to the real given real number. Okay, so examples of normal numbers. So Borel said almost every real number is normal. Almost any, every real number for a Fourier measure is normal. Uh, that doesn't really give you concrete examples. The first somewhat concrete example was given by Turing, who gave an algorithm to compute an absolutely normal number. Other algorithms were given by Schmidt, by Becker and Figuela. Uh, that was uh, this uh, Becker and Figuela uh, patched up a, a gap in Turing's argument. They also gave a, uh, a difference, an effectivization of a construction of Sierpinski. Uh, more recently, uh, several independently, several groups, uh, Becher, Heiber, and I, Lutz and Maradomo, Figuela and Nice all gave examples of absolutely normal numbers that uh, can be computable in polynomial time, which uh, Turing's example was a, a doubly exponential algorithm. Lutz and Meyer Domo gave, have the fastest algorithm. They have an algorithm which runs in nearly linear time. Okay, now this business of, of does normality trans, you know, what, what happens as you move from one base to, to another in the re representation of real numbers, well, Cassells and Schmidt showed that normality doesn't, is not base invariant. You can have a real number that's normal in one base, but not normal in another. So that's an interesting, an interesting situation. This was a, a, uh, in, a, in response to a question of Steinhaus, who also was interested in, in logical, uh, logical questions. So it's, it's an interesting thing about the representation of a number. It can look random in one base, but not look random in another. Right? And in fact, uh, let me go back. In fact, the way that uh, Cassell's proved it is Cassell's showed that if you look at the Cantor middle third set and take the uniform measure on the Cantor middle third set as we did, right? then almost every real uh, is uh, in, in the sense of that measure is normal in, in every base, 
which is not a power of three. So it's not normal in base three because it any real inside the Cantor middle third set in its base three representation, the digit one does not appear. You either go left or you go right and you can't go in the middle. Right, so the, the elements of the Cantor middle third set are as far from normal, they're not even simply normal in base three, they completely omit a digit. Right, so they're not normal in base three, but they are normal in every base that's multiplicatively independent to three. So I see I'm running out of time. I'm gonna have to skip ahead a little bit. Okay, so there's a there is a recent, uh, more recent, not not that recent anymore, uh, theorem that uh, Betcher and Bujo and I uh, proved, which is gives a characterization of what are the possibilities for simple normality. So if M is a set of natural numbers, right, then you can give a criteria. Uh, on the existence of a real number C. Oops, I'm not really good. C. Well, okay, here it is. I can't seem to get the highlighter to work. But all right. So you can give a characterization on C for C to be simply normal to a base if and only if that base is an element of M. So you can characterize what are the properties of M such that M, M tells you. Uh, the simple normality characteristic of some real. Okay, so it's it's uh, it's completely worked out. Uh, how does simple normality trans uh, transfer from base to base? Okay, the, the analogous in this realm in Diophantine approximation notion of compressibility is what's called the irrationality exponent. The irrationality exponent of a real C is the least upper bound. On, this, on a set of reals uh, z, such that the distance between c and p over q, which is how well p over, it's the error between p over q and c, is less than or equal to one over q and to the z. Okay, so this exponent z is, a, is an indicator of how well p over q approximates c in the scale of q. Okay, if z is large, then uh, being able to say that C is very close to P over Q is an instance of compression. And using only the information in P and Q, you can, you can describe quite a lot of C. Irrational numbers have irrationality exponent greater than or equal to two. Algebraic irrational numbers have exponent irrationality equal to two. Uh, random real has exponent irrationality two. And by a theorem of Yarnick and Besakovich, uh, if you have irrational, it's tied to Hausdorff dimension, as it should be expected by this compressibility factor. Uh, C as irrationality exponent alpha is a set of Hausdorff dimension two over alpha. And now, how does compressibility in this sense of rational approximation compare to normality? So how does compressibility compare to the uh, dual notion of uh, sort of being random with respect to some measure as, as indicated by normality? Okay. So Bougeot showed that uh, there's an absolutely normal Liouville number. Liouville number is a number that has infinite exponent of irrationality, has arbitrarily good rational approximation. On the one hand, the number looks, nor in every base, uh, the number is normal, right? But uh, it's exponent of your, but it has arbitrarily good rational approximation. So that's, that's different. That's quite different from saying compressibility is the same as, or uh, that incompressibility is the same as, as randomness, right? Here you could have arbitrary incompressibility, arbitrary compressibility, but random with respect to, to uh, normality. And this is based on a construction of Kaufman, where Kaufman showed that uh, the Liouville numbers have a positive Fourier dimension. Well, more of that's, yeah, what I just said is not true. If ha having, having a uh, exponent of irrational, positive exponent irrational, if you have exponent of irrationality positive, not infinite, then that set uh, has uh, 
finite non-zero uh, Fourier dimension. And then things happen in such a way that you can take a limit in a nice way, which is what Bujo contributed. Okay, a few years ago, we extended work of uh, Bamu and Bujo, and we showed that uh, there's really no connection between <coughs> the exponent of irrationality and the, the way normality works. You can have any prescribed pattern of simple normality, and you can have any uh, irrationality exponent consistent with that. Okay, now the uh, integer bases not only provide uh, a way to look at normality from different perspectives. They also give you a way to look at exponent of ir irrationality, namely compressibility, from different base perspectives. As the base B irrationality exponent of C is look at the irrationality exponent, but only consider uh, rational approximations where the which are which are written in base B. So you demand that the denominator be of the form B to the K. Same definition, except you, you don't use all rational approximations, you just use the ones uh, that are expressed in base B. And you get a notion of your rationality exponent. If C is normal in base B, then the base B irrationality exponent of C is equal to one. So that looks like a random real, right, is incompressible. If you're normal in base B, you're incompressible in the sense of irrationality exponent for base B approximations. Amu and Bougeau showed that you can have, uh, essentially across different bases, you can have, ex they have a, a gap at small exponents. Uh, so you can have essentially irrationally exponents in base P1 and base two are independent. Okay, now, the, I'd like to see uh, to what extent that independence can be made extreme. Right, so it's, can you have a real number that in one base looks completely, in this context, looks completely random? Namely, it's normal in one base. And in a second base, it looks absolutely compressible. Namely, it's, it's in that base, exponent of irrationality is infinite. And so, and the, there, there, it, it is possible to construct an example like this. There's a real number C, which is normal to base two. And in base 10, its exponent of irrationality is infinite. Okay, so in binary, the, the representation is normal. All the patterns show up with their expected frequency. But in, if you look at it in base 10, you're going to have sequences of digits, say a sequence of digits of length k. And that's going to be followed by n times k, uh, many zeros. So the, the preponderance of zeros is overwhelming. And so it's, it's far from normal in base 10. In fact, you get gaps where the, there's no non-trivial digit. You have, you have uh, n many digits, and then you have k times n many zeros. Okay, and the way that, the, that the, uh, the real is constructed is given by this. It's, a based, it's based on a generalization of Stoneham numbers. So you can give an explicit uh, representation of what such a real looks like. It's open to, to ask, uh, is there a real that's, can you get this not with two and then a composite number two times five? Can you get this, you know, how general is this phenomena? Is there a real number that's normal to base two and has base three exponent of irrationality equal to infinity? That's open and there's a lot of mysteries sought around what happens when you look at numbers in base two and in base three. So that's something to think about for the future. I put a lot of time into this one, but I guess I'm just not, well, I haven't done it yet. All right, that's, that's the end of my uh, talk. And thank you all for zooming in. And thanks again to the organizers for inviting me. Uh, be careful out there, my friends. Uh, it's, it's quite a dangerous world and uh, let's, let's all stay safe. Okay, so many thanks, Ted, for your interesting talk. Um, unfortunately, we cannot really clap our hands now, even though there is a way to simulate that in, in Zoom. Um, perhaps in order to coordinate the, the questions, I would ask those who actually want to ask a question to, to show a hand sign. 
Um, now, a lot of sums go up. I'm not sure that these are hand signs, but perhaps all hand signs which are coming in right now, I will take them as, as a question. So, um, Richard, um, do you want to ask a question? You have to unmute your microphone first. Please unmute your microphone. And that was the clap. So I, I meant to, uh, that would be a, a thank you asked for a thank you, so clap. So I. <laughs> okay. I clicked so, the sign. <laughs> or, or you took every sign to mean a question. So, no. Okay, so if, if anyone has a question, please uh, please show a hand sign so that I can see it. So there is... Um, okay, so uh, Peter, so do you want to ask your question? You, you have to... Yes, indeed. I hope you can hear me. Yes. Um, okay, now, when I was a math student back in the 60s, and 70s, there was a lot of interest in so-called transcendence measures, which were kind of having a degree of approximability, basically starting from the idea that if a number was too well approximated by rationals, it had to be transcendent. I'm curious whether you have uh, encountered some link with this old Baker theory about transcendence degrees. Yeah, so it's the, um, I, there is a link between uh, approximation by algebraic numbers and, and uh, dimension. So there's, there's, what one can look at approximation by rationals as we did. Right? And then, uh, Ask how well you know, if if you're if you're prime if if you're really well motivated by, in, by number theoretic or algebraic considerations, you might you're interested in rational numbers, <coughs> algebraic numbers, and so forth. And Roth's theorem was a theorem that addressed how well can algebraic numbers be approximated by rational numbers, and, and he showed that the that the uh, Irrationality exponent for an irrational algebraic number is equal to two. Now you can also ask about instead of using rational numbers to approximate real numbers, you can use algebraic numbers to approximate real numbers. And then there's there's a hierarchy there of types of real numbers. And I think you know, it's, and you can look at how well is a real number approximated by quadratic numbers. So rational numbers are sort of linear numbers. Their solutions to linear Diophantine equations. You could look at approximation by quadratic, by ternary, et cetera. Yeah, so there's, and there's extremely interesting problems there. And, and, and quite, in, you know, quite a lot of mathematics, as you said, quite a lot of mathematics has been developed there in the 50s, 60s, and 70s in particular. Um, that's sort of hard swimming for me. Because it, it's so you haven't more, yet explored this connection. <laughs> no, I, ha I haven't. I, ha I only to the extent of of uh, trying to you know of looking at what uh, comparing you no know, comparing uh, the compressibility by algebraic numbers or the compressibility by rational numbers and comparing that with what you can say about compressibility by uh, algorithmic methods. So. Uh, Betcher Ryman and I have some some results that say that you can have real numbers that are incompressible by by rat in the sense of irrationality exponent, and that, that also works for transcendental exponent compress compressibility by virtue of algebraic approximation. Comparing those aspects of compressibility to compressibility by algorithmic methods, so you can show that there are numbers whose whose irrationality exponent is, is as big as you want, but its algorithmic exponent of compressibility is as small as you want. You can, you can show that the, the, uh, they are more or less independent notions, except that you know, if you're compressible by, al by algebraic, you are compressible by algorithmic. But other than that, that's, that's about as deep as we got into it. Thank you. It's not for lack of trying. It's not for lack of trying. It's a real <laughs> interesting problem. 
Okay, so we, we have another question by, by Arno. So Arno, do you want to pose your question? Uh, uh, yes, um, my question is on the result that um, being a Sotolem a, set is a, is a Pi 3 complete property. Um, is that essentially just com composed from saying, okay, the, um, the complexity of, of, of getting the Fourier the dimension of a set is this, and then the complexity of getting the um, host of dimension is that. So asking for both of them being being equal ends up being 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 pi zero three, or does the result really? Um, well, there's there is a uh, the way the way that that kind of proof that this proof works is. Uh, so you had, the way that index set calculations work in general is that you, you have to be able to trans, transform the, uh, well, there's two parts, right? Making something complete and seeing that it's pi zero three. Yeah, my, 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 my question is, is about it, it being pi zero three. Yeah, so for that, for that you, have to, you have to look at the set of representations of measures Right. And and uh, get get you know, represent that as a nice compact set. The measures that have so you can guess right. You can guess the uh, you know, inside there. You can look to say is there a measure that has Fourier dimension greater than s right? that that lives on this set. So it's. Yeah, so I, I guess that's the best I can tell you is that it has to do with with representing the space of of uh, Fourier measures and seeing uh, that it's compact. And once it's compact, you get it into the realm of an arithmetic calculation. Okay. So um, is your question answered, Arno? Or uh, yeah, yeah, I think we are. Okay, yeah, so I, I don't see any further hands up in, in the moment. So if somebody wants to ask another question, please uh, put your hand up. Um, uh, Svetlana, I'm, um, do you want to ask a question? Uh, you, you have to unmute your microphone first, otherwise we can't hear you. Sorry for all the stupid questions. So one more stupid question. Uh, so no explicit, absolutely normal numbers are known. Is that correct? Uh, yes, that's correct. So it's it's open. It's open. Uh, I mean, it's, it's open for the usual mathematical constants. So it's it's open whether there's an absolutely normal algebraic number. Though though it's conje Burrell conjectured that all the irrational algebraic numbers are are absolutely normal. That's open. It's open whether pi is is uh, absolutely normal. Um, yeah, no, but for example, this construction of Liu will absolutely normal number. I understand that maybe you cannot describe it algebraically, but is it constructive or not? Oh yeah, so it's it's the the Bougeot, the Bougeot construction was not constructive, but the, it is possible to so uh, Betra Heiber and I did give a in the sense of, you know, in concrete in the sense that there's an algorithm to produce an absolutely normal mm -hmm. number. So it's, but it's not explicit in the same way that, that uh, in, there is a very explicit number right on mm -hmm. this page. You know, if you specify what n and, and what the n sequence and the m sequence is, that's, an ex, that's a very concrete thing. Right? If these things grow iterated exponentially, then, then uh, you get an, such an example. So that's, there's no example of an absolutely normal number that is that concrete. Okay. So no, so that's, a, that's quite, quite an interesting open problem. Right? Are any of the familiar mathematical constants absolutely normal? Open. Okay, and one more question, if I may. Uh, so, it, you, if you construct um, measures um, that are like Lebesgue measure, but uh, with a different uh, coin, with a biased coin, so yeah, the Bernoulli measure, measure singular with respect to Lebesgue measure, is it known that the Hausdorff dimension and Fourier dimension are the same? Uh, I 
I don't know the answer to that. Sorry. Yeah, so that's now you hit the edge of my harmonic analysis. Okay. Uh, Turkey, so it's, so, okay, yeah. so perhaps we have uh, one uh, last question that's coming from uh, Ali. So could you please um, pose your question? Uh, do you uh, hear me? Yeah. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, my question is about, in fact, about logic. Uh, uh, if you consider the structure of the natural numbers uh, with just addition and without multiplication, uh, of course, if, if we have multiplication, then uh, Gödel phenomena will arise there. But uh, without multiplication, there are some uh, attempts to add some traces of multiplication to this structure with addition. Uh, now, for example, uh, adding a sequence of uh, adding a sequence of natural numbers, and as a function to that structure, then uh, my question is that uh, if uh, we add uh, uh, a sequence that is obtained from uh, from a number that is, for example, normal or uh, absolutely normal, uh, and etc. Uh, is the resulted structure is decidable or not? Uh, are there some results about it? I haven't heard that problem before. Um, no, I don't. I don't know of any work along those lines. Oh. Uh, that sounds that sounds open to me. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Interesting problem. Okay, so then um, many thanks for your talk again, Ted. So it was really great talk to start with.